One Christmas was never quite like the other in those years in upstate New York, nearby the black dirt, and the pines, and the Sugarloaf Mountain, all covered since Thanksgiving with a healthy velvet of white, slick, crisp, and slippery, depending upon the time of day, nighter clouds, and angle of the sun. One Christmas was never like another, but all from the morning of my eyes to the time when this snow-packed, snow-suited, frost-bitten, chap-lipped boy went bounding toward the adulthood that swallows us, left as such, to wish for the simple truth of a grayish, yellow, snow-bound sky and snowflakes that gave chase and cooled the tips of tongues. And then there was the radio that gave us the freedom of a snow day. Following are the school closings for the greater Middletown area. That's mine, said little Philip, squealing with glee. Quiet, I want to hear mine, said Chris, the big brother, chomping at his bed. Quiet, both of you, said Carol, the sister sandwiched between two boys and wishing at least one was a sister. Breakfast is ready, Mom yelled from the kitchen. Dad was off climbing poles, restoring salvation to the phoneless, cut off by the crack of swirling winds, with the intermittently gloved fingers to saving the hands that made us and brought home the turkeys and hams and the makings of eggnog, nutmeg, and spice. Trudging in snow, sorrelled and scarfed, he strode like Gawain or Arthur and breathed deep drafts of freezing ether and blasted forth great clouds of short-lived warmth that fought with the air like messianic gospels, swallowed but never digested. His fight was alone in the cold, while we fought each other down the stairs that led to breakfast and a snow day on the edge of a Christmas vacation. Two glorious weeks sand school books with unfettered sledding and ice skating on the pond turned silver and soft seven-year wrecks on the slope, in the ice-covered muddy banks, and forgot about the factory. The brick factory and all its industry now defunct, but red and lettered forever in the walls of my school, and every home rose from its opening to its closing decades later. Its oral history, a tradition known only by the few who dabble in trivia of living things and lives once led. Seven days till Christmas, exclaimed Philip. Better get this letter to Santa. It's coming. The mailbox was just around the corner, but breakfasted and warm and snug in their snow day, the brother and sister couldn't be bothered. Perhaps I'll see Mike McGarr, he thought, and his guns and souvenirs from World War II, or Mario and eat lasagna, or Punky and his seven sisters, or maybe still I'll see Kevin, Days blend then, one to the other, and clarity is in the coming, and Santa and the drummer boys, and the whistling wind of carol singing strollers, muffler and mitten, and smitten with the instance of meeting a thankful face and regular requests for more. Should we shovel driveways? Old Mr. Dina Torres might slip and fall, said Philip. He pays good, too, replied Chris, while on his way to becoming an accountant. You're like Ebenezer, said Philip. No, I just know what makes things go round. Come on, little man, I'll split it with you. Each driveway seemed to say something about the occupants of the house. This one had two strips of cement, and one must be careful to keep on the track. And at the same time, in spring, they had more places for grass to grow. Another was blacktop and been potholed, and it might be said these folks could scarcely afford our labors, and it was Christmas spirit that gave them to open their purses to two boys of seven and eleven. The Fancher's house was a grail of sorts and shiny. Miss Fancher, the lollipop lady in summer, had a park named for her, and the icicles that hung from her long porch glistened like silver Corinthian columns and we'd get five dollars for just the walk and tipped with candy canes for the family. 
You boys be good now. Santa's watching. And be good to your mother and father, she'd say, as we left now, moving to the far reaches of a tundra, which seemed to encompass the known world. Brother would then tell of Jack London and the Yukon, and cutting dogs open to keep your hands warm. I'd be glad that home was just a block away, and that we hadn't a dog for brother to butcher. Flour, sugar, water, ginger, oil, baking soda, and salt. Dry stuff first, then wet, mixed in a Pyrex bowl. Heat it, roll it, cut it, allowing for windows and doors, then bake it. White frosting mortar, red and green M&Ms, peppermint candies, and red hots. The kitchen is filled with the heavy scent of gingerbread. Now don't eat too much of the icing. It'll make you sick and rot your teeth, mother said. Okay, mom, but my stomach already hurts. Drink some club soda. And Carol, can you hand me the ice cream? A classic salt box blueprint, pressed in the pages of a 1962 Betty Crocker cookbook. The instructions written in a hand long since passed on. It's important to get the first two walls together straight and strong. Here, Mom, I'll hold them, says the little boy. Thank you, Philip. And Carol, can you get me a wet towel? Mom breathes heavily through her mouth, though her lips are close together. The air almost makes a whistling sound, and Philip thinks how like music or the sound of the wind it is. Mom is copying the weather outside, he thinks. Jack Frost and North winds blowing across the continent and threatening to collapse the gingerbread walls. The weather sent Dad out on overtime, fixing phone lines. Her thumb struggles against the icer and turns red in places, and flushes to white in others, and the pressure looks to Philip as if it might hurt. Hard to push that thing down, Mom. Yes, but I've got it. It shouldn't come out too fast or too slow. Do you want to try it? You better do this first part, Mom. I'll try on the next one. Okay, hold the two walls up and steady. Philip holds the walls up and hopes his hands won't shake or wobble. He feels his shoulder muscles tighten and his fingers tense. He starts to breathe like his mother, and now he's Jack Frost. Steady, says his mom. I'm trying, says Philip. Mom squirts the icing all down the length of the walls where they make a corner together. Okay, she says, and motions for Philip to let go. Mom then wiggles the walls so they fit tightly. Hold them again, please. She squirts more icing on the inside and the outside of the walls and leans and takes a long, satisfying breath. You guys want to go out now and play. This is going to take a while to dry. I'll get my sled, says Philip. Your big brother should be down by the pond. Get your warm jackets on and I'll see you in about an hour. Sister Carol has the watch, and Philip admires that she will be the one to know when it's time to come back. Out through the back door, the ground crunches under their feet, with Philip nearly falling as he walked down the back steps. There's a layer of ice under a couple inches of snow, and his rubber boots can't find friction. Hurry up, you little poop, sister says. It's icy, says Philip. Well, step down hard like me. Carol steps down hard, and Philip sees that her footsteps are deep, and the ridges around her footsteps serve as support walls for her boots. They don't slip, and she strides like an Eskimo around the back of the garage into Mr. Van Leuven's yard. Do you think we could toboggan Mr. Van Leuven's yard, Philip asks. Not steep enough, Carol replies. They trudge through the open space of the yard. The snow is deeper there in the open space, away from the trees, and it threatens to sneak into their boots. Philip keeps his head down, watching for it to do so, and runs head first into his sister. What are you doing, he asks. My underwear is crawling up my butt, she says, adjusting the seat of her pants. You've got a wedgie, Philip says, smiling. Shut up, you little poop, Carol says. At the guardrail, where Washington Street turns and goes down, they drag their sleds around the end of the rail, 
and look for signs of their brother and other kids. Their breath is like pipe smoke, and Philip thinks how it looks like there are a couple of Godzillas about to burn each other. I'm Godzilla, he says, and rushes at his sister. Rawr. Get away, you little dork. Stop calling me names or I'll tell Mom. I'm sorry, she replies, smiling. You little dork. How'd you like it, he says. All right, I'm sorry. I'm going first, he says, and jumps in front of his sister. The trail is steep and smooth. In summer, it's strewn with craggy rocks and divots, but the ice is filled it in, and Philip feels like an Olympic luge racer on a Yankee clipper. He negotiates the twists and turns with grace, ducking beneath the sticker bushes as he nearly derails a couple of times, then slows to the opening woods, where he grabs the sled's leash and begins to drag it toward the pond. He looks up the hills which they call the pines and is projected in his mind along the dusted treetops and imagines himself as, again as Jack Frost, this time flying and blowing the snow into little tornadoes. The pines are his Sherwood, or Black Forest, and he situates himself among them as a claymation figure from the Christmas shows on TV. Carol comes sliding in behind him, red-faced and smiling. The trail's perfect, he says. Yeah, that was a good ride. The two continue walking toward the pond. Can I drag your sled for you? asks Philip. I've got it, thanks. How do you think the gingerbread's doing? We've got a little time. I love you, sis. I love you, too. The two would be grounded together soon after, and it was because they loved each other it would be okay. The snowman rolled in spheres that revealed the green of grass beneath, and stacked in breeze we endeavored to emulate the lights of which we'd seen on TV with Rudolph and Hermie, and Silver and Gold. Yukon Cornelius and Eve Meyer, the story of Jesus and Nestor, the long-haired donkey, an ugly duck named Blessing. Dad returned from the Siberian drifts and cold high wind chills. We huddled on an itchy couch and wound ourselves through a concert of five voices in the firelight. Mitch Miller songbooks chalked with chestnuts roasting, winter wonderlands and merry gentlemen resting, with the chimes of silver bells and memories of our grandparents and Yonkers, and the clean streets of Manhattan made glorious with garlands and chalk full of nuts cups of coffee and hot chocolate with peppermints. The buildings lit like candles dancing toward a sky that reached for the convening of Santa's race around the world. John Denver shared Aspen Club and taught us the beauty of a cowboy's Christmas, myself riding a black beauty in the heart of plains, with thanks given to the stars that the city's never seen. And I would imagine his Zachary as me I think Dad would have sung this song to him, had music been his life. The talk then turns to the wooded journey for our tree, and me pretending I'm tiny Tim and finding a pine branch to use as a crutch. And in the end, the scene descends toward a baby in the main room, placed by my mother, with loving insistence and a wish for another year, filled with love and hardships overcome. Children asleep parents take the last minutes of this silent night to assemble that which Santa had at the time, then settle in for a few hours rest and the best day of the year when all will rise to the birth of Christ and open the gifts given 